I thought I would start with a little story about how the journal started for me. Uh, this is Sandy Cove Beach in Dublin, some of you might recognise it, and it was there on a beautiful June's day uh, last year that I got a phone call which would lead to me, uh, well, would change my life for the last year. At the end of the phone was Aileen O'Toole, who I think is here somewhere. She was my um, first employer. She gave me my first break at the Sunday Business Post, and now she's at amas.ie. And she said, Jennifer, I want to talk to you about an opportunity to get involved in um, an amazing startup. It's a really innovative project. It combines media, social media, online journalism, and I think, you know, you'd be just right for it. And I thought about it, and I thought, I had a little flash forward to what the future might look like. Um, Something like that, maybe. Perhaps not in quite that much glorious technical or detail, but I imagine myself back in an office. And just to give you a little bit of context, um, at the time, I had a very nice life. I was freelancing. I had a column with the Sunday Business Post. I had a couple of blogs. I was doing a bit of corporate work, a bit of, bit of um, political speech writing. And generally, I was kind of having a lot of fun. Um, I'd been at Sandy Cove Beach with my, my two little kids as well. So they were a consideration, and I thought about it. But I thought, you know what, this is an opportunity to get involved in a new business from scratch, to, to, get, um, to have the chance to shape something from scratch, which, if I'm honest, I've always thought about starting my own business. And to be frank about it, no bank is ever going to give me the money. So I thought, well, if somebody else is prepared to gamble their money and I can take some of the credit for being involved in it, then why not? So I weighed it all up, um, and that was my response. I said, no way, I'm not going to do it. Why would I mess up what I've got? Like, things are working out for me. I've got a nice work-life balance, and I really don't want to get involved in a 24-7 news site. But Aileen is persuasive. Um, she is very persuasive. So I agreed to meet her for coffee. And over coffee, I learned a little bit more about what the journal was going to be. Um, and specifically, I learned that these visionaries that you can see there, those dynamic go-getters, and, um, and David McWilliams, who <laughs> is not involved. Uh, David's just there as the eye candy. But um, the other two are the Fallon brothers. And I knew a few things about the Fallon brothers, as I'm sure most of you do. Any self-respecting person who's at the Dublin Web Summit must know a lot about the Fallon brothers. So I'm going to pick someone out of the... No, I'm only joking. Um, the Fallon brothers, Brian set up Daft.ie in his bedroom at the age of 15 as part of um, a business studies project in transition year. And I knew that much about him. It was only later that I found out that he didn't actually win the business studies comp competition with uh, Daft.ie. He came second. But at the time, I thought, yeah, you know, these guys, they, they had built it up from what had been a transition year project. They had built it up um, and they'd acquired um, various other companies. And just, they'd, they'd built it up into Daft.ie. They'd acquired boards, boardsdeals.ie, um, and adverts.ie as well. And I thought, you know, with their knowledge of how to build good websites, I thought, I can't lose. You know, this is really a chance I should take. Um, I also learned that um, Eamon and Brian were both really phenomenally um, enthusiastic about the idea of building an online site, um, so much so that Brian and my other colleague, Adriana Costa, had travelled to the States over the previous year, and they'd met with people from Gawker and Huffington Post and Business Insider, and they had done a huge amount of research, and they knew what it was that they wanted to achieve with the journal. So I took the job. Um, and that was it. It didn't take me long to reconsider, to be totally honest about it. I think that one coffee with Aileen by the end of it, I was sold. Um, so what was the big idea that we developed and that I was so sold on? Basically, we wanted to make the Journal Ireland's first fully interactive news website. We thought that there, there was a gap in the market, um, and it wasn't being met by the traditional media interests to make news a shared experience. Um, and we felt that the old media weren't keeping up with the pace of change that they were still very focused on daily news cycles and on very traditional concepts of what was news and how news breaks and how news should break. Um, but we believed, and actually we still believe even more so, that consumers are no longer so focused on who had the story first. They want to know, where can I read it now? Who's got the best video? Uh, what do other people think about this story? They want to be able to comment on it. They want to, um, they want to share it. They want to be able to share it with maximum ease with their friends on Twitter and on Facebook. So we thought that there was an opportunity to design a product for the medium. Um, and very early on, we made a decision about that about the journal, that about 50% of its content would be aggregated and 50% of the content would be original. Um, and since I've used the A word now, we might as well get it out of the way. Um, is news aggregation theft? 
I figured that one of you would probably ask me this later on, so I thought that we would we'd get it out of the way now. Um, and I'd be interested to ask for a show of hands, like who here thinks that news aggregation is, is theft? I think I see one person. Well, that's okay. Good, you're going to be a, a much um, easier audience to persuade than I imagined, because I've got loads of points here about why aggregation is not theft, but maybe we can just skip on to the next section. Um, well, since, since I've gone to the trouble of making up my slide, I'll go through it anyway. We believe that aggregation helps our, our readers to navigate the vast news landscape. Um, we believe that aggregation is about finding the good stuff in other publications and sending people to it. Um, and we think that aggregation works for everybody. In the States, it's known as the link economy, and it's, it's fairly simple, like you link to me, I link to you, and we both get something out of it. And that's pretty much the model on which the journal works. Um, so, and, you know, for the record, I, I do think that there are things that the print media does better than anybody else. Um, but there are some people who only want the pithy digest, and there are some people who sometimes only want the pithy digest. And that's what we try to provide at the journal. So that was kind of the big idea. I suppose I jumped ahead a little bit in talking about aggregation. Um, and I skipped over talking about news, because I actually do think that there is something to be said about what, what news is now. Once upon a time, the answer to this question used to be relatively straightforward. <laughs> news was whatever my old friend, Anne Doyle, who I used to work with on the 9 o'clock news in RT, it was whatever she said it was. It was what was reported in newspapers, it was what was on radio, and it was what was on TV. Of course, that's still the case to an extent. But a number of critical things have changed, and this is where we believe the journal comes in. Um, we think that the single all-knowing source, um, news no longer comes from one single all-knowing source, I suppose you could say. Um, readers dip into a variety of sources. They travel from one to the other via links that are shared with them on Twitter or on Facebook or just through browsing on the internet or through RSS feeds. Um, and we believe that news has also become a conversation. Um, we think that much of that conversation happens now on the internet. And social media sites like Twitter and Facebook are no longer just the break. The, they're no longer just um, media for breaking news. They're occasionally the story themselves. And increasingly, over the course of the year of the journal, we found a lot of stories that are basically stories about Twitter that ha have ended up being huge news stories for us. Um, and we also think that consumers are no longer passive. They want to share and they want to shape the news and they want to collaborate in the news by, that could mean you know, sending in a photogra photographs of a concert that they've been at or voting in our daily poll or commenting on our stories. So it, it's changed and it's become much more a conversation. So where does the journal come into all this? Well, we believe that the thing that's most, um, from, the, from the outset, I suppose, we set out to do two things with the journal. And one was the ability to share, and the other was the ability to shape. Now, I showed this slide to my husband the other day, and he looked at me blankly. Um, and it turns out he's never seen the movie Ghost. So if there's anyone out there that hasn't seen the movie Ghost, you'll need to ask your neighbor what that's about, or you can grab me afterwards. Um, <laughs> maybe not literally grab me afterwards. Um, so that's the big idea behind the journal. Um, the launch, this is something we started working on almost immediately last summer. We spent a lot of time tweaking the product and thinking about what we wanted the journal to be like. We tried out a few earlier versions of the site um, on Family and Friends, and we got, I suppose, what you might kindly describe as a quite mixed reaction to some of the early incarnations. But we, we teased it and we worked on it. We made some technological changes and some content changes. And when we felt that we were ready to go, um, we launched sort of a very softly, softly Twitter tweezer ca teaser campaign where we talked about you know, the journal and were involved in something. And we got a little bit of interest going that way. Um, and from September, we launched a limited invite-only trial. So you had to log on to the journal's homepage um, and register your interest. And that was just really a way of controlling the traffic that would come to it, because we weren't sure how well our servers would stand up. And as we were to discover, and I'll get on to in a minute, not always that well. but. Um, so we went to full beta trial in October. Um, and in the meantime, we, we sort of built, um, we, we had an instinct, I suppose, very early on, that social media users would be our core audience. The people who use Twitter and Facebook a lot would probably like the journal. And so we went, we used Twitter and Facebook to target them as much as we could. Um, 
And that's proven to be the case. We now have 50,000 Facebook friends and 15,000 followers on Twitter. So, and we've learned that there's, you, know, you have to handle those two audiences very differently. We post a very limited number of stories on our Facebook page, um, but our Twitter page, we post pretty much everything that goes up on the site. And so far, we seem to be, we seem to be keeping the two audiences happy, but it's, it's, not, always, um, it's not always that straightforward. Um, so who reads the journal? Okay, well, the number one, I suppose, is our morning commuter. I affectionately like to call these um, the board at work, um, or the board on the train, the board at work, and the board in front of the TV. So basically, but I mean, that's not really, they're not bored, obviously, if they're coming to the journal. Um, so they're commuting, to, they're commuting to, on the train to work, and they're having a look at the journal. So we get a big surge in traffic at about 8 a.m. in the morning. Then they're dipping in and out during the day. Um, and then we get a big, another big surge at 8 p.m. in the evening, which I presume is people at home um, using their smartphones and their iPads.